What if you could throw a net out in your local river and come back with an entire aquarium full of fish in just one scoop? There are places in the world where that's actually true, and we'll take you there in this FinCast. Hi everybody, John here with another FinCast, and boy have I got a treat for you today. I will be taking you along on a snorkel trip in the Rio Negro River in South America. And this is a place where there is an amazing density of fish, many of which you'll recognize that you can buy at your big box store, but this is where they originate. And we'll be talking with Mike Tuccinardi, who is a writer for Amazonas Magazine, and he has a video out there that will blow your mind. We did an interview with Mike, and he's going to tell us about it, including what's it like to snorkel in a river where there's anacondas, caimans, which are like crocodiles, uh, and all of that just in order to get this amazing video. And then talk a little bit about what the people are like and some of their techniques as well, and how they catch these fish and how they eventually wind up for sale for the aquarium trade. I met Mike years ago when he was the marketing director for Seagrist Farms, which is a wholesaler that supplies stores all across the United States. And since then, he's taken off on a series of adventures. He's been to Asia and South America on numerous occasions, and he is studying the fish trade. And when he does that, he actually goes out to the places where our fish come from in the wild. And he's had some amazing adventures. So I had an opportunity to talk to him about the Rio Negro, which is one of the largest tributaries for the Amazon River, and some video that he took when he was there. Now let me give you a little bit of background about where they are. All of this video was taken around a place called Darqua, which is a small fishing village, home to maybe 25 people, and these people make their livelihood by catching aquarium fish. In order to get to Darqua, Mike tells me, first of all, you have to fly into Manaus, which he says is the largest city in the world that doesn't have any roads that go there, so you've got to fly in or go by boat. And then from Manaus, you make your way to this little village of Darqua by spending at least two days on a small boat that takes you up the river. It's a motorized boat. It's a three-story boat, he says. In order to sleep, they just string hammocks on the uh, third deck and it takes a couple of days to get up river until eventually he arrives, arrives at this little place called Darkwa. Now I'm anxious to get to his video, so the first thing I want to do is have him describe a little bit about what happens when you first put on the snorkel and you get in the water. The density of fish there is incredible. I mean, it's just like the, the biomass of but just the sheer amount of fish that you see in front of you at all times, no matter whether you're in six inches of water or 12 feet, it's really crazy. So this spot is a little at Garapé, and that's a phrase that's used in the uh, Amazon region to describe, it technically means canoe path, but it's a small creek that winds through flooded forests, and uh, that's typical fish habitat as opposed to like the main river channels, which are huge and just you know, full of big fish, but you're not going to find a lot of aquarium species there. So this is in Igarape, uh outside the village of Darqua, which is a really small fishing village about a day's journey upriver from the city of Barcelona. So we're right in the middle of the Rio Negro here, which is uh, one of the larger Amazon tributaries and actually the largest blackwater river in the world. So you're out there and you've got a snorkel and you're looking under the water, tell everybody what it is you're seeing. Well, at first it's a little disconcerting actually because you're in this tea-colored water, there's a lot of sediment that's floating around you, and you don't see much. Uh, it actually takes a bit of practice and time to really see what can be seen there. So, uh, at first you just gotta acclimate to the low lighting and the somewhat odd conditions. This is very, very different from uh, snorkeling a you know Caribbean reef or something. Yeah, so as soon as you get really acclimated under the water, the first thing that you're going to see darting in front of your face are huge groups of tetris, and you'll generally see a bunch of species mixed together, which is interesting. I think in the aquarium hobby, you tend to think, well, you're going to do 12 of these tetras and maybe a few others, but uh, in the wild, they're usually mixed aggregations of species, and uh, one of the first ones you'll see is known locally as the brycon, but that's a really common tetra throughout the region. You don't see it in the aquarium trade much because uh, they're kind of aggressive, 
but they'll get so close to you, they're fearless. They'll come right up and actually pick at your mask. Uh, they'll pick at your skin. So they're right, right up in front of you. And once uh, the other species see that they've made a move to approach you, then the other species you start to feel safer. And you'll see pencil fish. You'll see the that red that tetra with the red eye in the video. That's a pretty neat species. You also don't see much in the trade. Um, and then, of course, you'll start to see the cardinals and the hatchets that are a little bit more reserved and shy. Wow. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there was just the, the density of the fish was incredible. It is. It's really remarkable. And part of that is due to the Amazon's uh, seasonal flooding pattern. So this is a time when the water level is fairly low and all the fish are concentrated in one small area. So. You have to figure when the river floods, those fish are suddenly able to disperse and find food in a much larger area. But for a good portion of the year, these fish are just densely packed in these little uh, igarapes and, and creeks and swamps. And it's remarkable the, the diversity and just sheer number of fish you'll see. I had to ask him too about the danger involved because I'm thinking, okay, South American river, there's piranhas in there, there's snakes that'll eat you, there's a uh, caiman, which is a crocodile type of uh, reptile as well. So I asked him if he was worried when he got in the water. I mean, are you concerned for your safety at all when you get in this river? Very rarely. Uh, it's incredible how safe it is. You'll see piranha and they, they have no interest in humans. You'll see, uh, uh, we came across some large anacondas, no problem. The two things you do worry about in the area, it's just something to be conscious of, the stingrays and electric eels. Uh, the stingray, are actually this, this video is shot in a really popular area for stingrays. So it's a sandy bottom, shallow area, and there are tons and tons of rays here. Um, we did come across a couple large beetles, uh, you know, well over two feet, in, in one area in a similar spot to this in clear black water that was actually flowing, which is kind of unusual for them. They tend to like the stagnant pools. Uh, so just, you know, that's something to be cautious of. I've fortunately never had too close an encounter. I'm kind of fascinated by this, I'm sorry, but how far away do you have to be to get zapped and what could the damage be? Uh, I mean, a full-size electric eel can knock you unconscious um, and you have the risk of drowning at that point. But it's more likely you'll just get re really, really badly electrocuted. And uh, the anacondas and all that, you've, you've seen those in the water? Yeah, yeah, in the water I tend not to worry about them. Uh, outside the water, they tend to be a little more, uh, they're more nervous and more likely to be aggressive in the water. They usually just sit there like a log. I've passed a few where I didn't realize what they were, thinking they were submerged logs, and then only looking through the video footage later realized what it was. And caimans and that type of stuff, are those around? Yeah, and those you do want to be generally kind of careful about. Um, there are some spots that at night you'll uh, take your flashlight out and you see you spot them by the eye reflection and you'll just see dozens and dozens of eyes all along the banks and then you realize, wow, we were snorkeling there earlier this afternoon. I apologize for the quality of that video feed. Mike's lips aren't really keeping up with his words because of the, the bandwidth because we were, we're basically doing a FaceTime uh, and I recorded it. but. Uh, we'll work on getting that better for, for future FinCast because I think this is something that, that I'm very excited about doing. So let's have Mike talk a little bit more about the numerous numbers of fish and the species of fish that he saw during that snorkel trip. So now let's go back to your, uh, your fish and the fish all swarming around you and that kind of stuff. And uh, when these guys fish for those, the fish that wind up in the aquarium trade, are they doing it from their canoes? Are they snorkeling? How do they catch those fish? It really varies by species, but uh, probably the most interesting is how they catch cardinal tetras in this area. And this exact Europe uh, has been a fishing site for the aquarium trade for over three generations. So it's, it's pretty amazing that uh, you can see, number one in the video, how dense the fish populations still are. But uh, this spot is so productive that year after year, the fishers from the village of Darakwa will go there and collect. And so for cardinals, what they do is they'll get out of the canoe in a small area, and they do this thing called calling the fish. And so one of the fishers will take their hand on the surface of the water, 
and just splash a couple times. And the fish in the dry season are so uh, conditioned and usually so starved that anything falling from above from the trees is a potential source of food. So splashing on the surface of the water makes them think, okay, food source, let's check this out. And uh, so they'll do that, and if they see cardinals in the mix, then they take their uh, a large net that's uh, just a simple hand net, and they kind of herd the, the cardinal tetras into the net with a canoe paddle. Wow, and that, like, one net dip would produce, what, 100 cardinal tetras, or what? It depends, but on a good day, hey, yeah, one scoop could easily produce a couple hundred cardinals. So then, as you start to look closer, you start to see some of the little cichlids. I saw the checkerboard cichlids, and yeah. I think I saw a pistogramma in there. Uh, so tell me how the, you know, like, the less common non-schooling species start to emerge. Yeah, they're, that's almost the same as what you do with the tetras. You just sit and wait, and they're almost always there. That, that's one of the things that it took me a few tries to really realize uh, snorkeling here is that in that carpet of leaf litter uh, by the shore in the extreme shallows, that is just full of fish. It's completely loaded with dwarf cichlids and catfish. And so you just have to give them a second to acclimate to your presence. And then all of a sudden you start to see the movement in the leaves. And uh, as you can see in the video, there's just hundreds of checkerboard cichlids. There's epistogrammas, there's uh, little uh, talking catfish, the dorinids in the, in the nets there. Uh, if you were to take a net and kind of scoop through that leaf litter, you'll also likely find a lot of uh, knife fish, possibly autosynclus type catfish, some really interesting species. Yeah, it's, it's so cool. And then there was a real interesting looking sort of elongated cichlid that you had in there. What was that? Oh yeah, the big pike cichlids, sure. Uh, there's a lot of big pike cichlid species in this type of habitat that you come across. And typically you'll come across breeding pairs. So I believe the, uh, the one in the, in the video was Crenicicla lenticulata, the spotted pike. And that one was a female, but uh, in certain areas like this, you do tend to come across pairs that'll have their whole cloud of little babies around them and they, they will actively defend them. They're fearless. They'll come right up to you and kind of uh, do a threat defense in front of you to try and get you away from their territory. It's, it's really cool. But by the way, there's something out there that I've mentioned in some earlier FinCasts called Project Piaba. Project Piaba basically looks at the livelihood that people get from collecting fish for the aquarium hobby, and it's studied whether there's a negative impact on the environment from overfishing, and there's not, because the uh, biotope there, the, the Amazon, the Rio Negro, are, are so rich and so diverse that the, little, the few number of fish that are being taken out of the water uh, are not a threat to the populations of these fish. So that's number one. And number two, this is a great way for people who live down in these third world countries, way out essentially, literally, in the wilderness, in the jungle, in the rainforest, whatever you want to call it, it's a great way for them to make a living. And if they didn't have this opportunity, then there's the potential that they would have to go in and start uh, burning the rainforest and shifting to agriculture, or these people sometimes wind up moving to the city where they wind up receiving handouts from the government. So there's a lot of value in maintaining the jobs for these people out there in the jungles uh, in the Amazon River Basin. So something to think about. And remember Project Piava, I'll put a link to that in the description as well. So thanks so much to Mike Tushinardi, and by the way, I will put a link with the description of this video to an article that he has written for Amazonas Magazine that appears online. There's a more comprehensive list of some of the fish that are in there, and, and as he even points out in his article, if you watch that video slowly enough, you might see some fish that even he hadn't seen, so you may see something that you want to add to it. And again, that'll be with the description of this. Thanks again to uh, Amazonas Magazine, uh, which really is a very high quality magazine in, in the hobby. My, in my opinion, it's, the, it's, it's glossy pages, but it's very well researched articles, and, and in my mind, it's the best freshwater magazine that, that is out there. So thanks to them for, for letting Mike talk with us.
It was really amazing to go underwater and see what is what is actually down there and the density of the fish down there in the Rio Negro. And so thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoyed this unique fin cast. Let me know what you think of it because uh, I'd like to do more of this stuff and I think Mike would too and he's about to set off on some more world travel so maybe that's something that we can look at. I appreciate you watching and I'll see you in the next fin cast.